<laughs> I know, literally. Well, when you posted on you posted on Instagram, I was like, okay, we're, we're, let's go. And then it was like a lot of traction. Yeah. Sage hit me up. Sage wanted to jump in here too. <laughs> oh man, we should have a guest uh, guest MC. The ne- sure. Next one. Yeah, this has to be a continual vibe. I'm going to kick it off, guys, as people are joining and welcome you to the latest Fashion Scholarship Fund uh, virtual moment and presentation. Tonight's theme is postmodern, changing the game. I'm super excited to be joined by Fashion Scholarship friend and supporter and most recently board member Virgil Abloh, founder and chief creative director of Off-White and men's artistic director of Louis Vuitton. Thank you, Virgil, for joining us. Virgil's uh, joined by his friend and colleague, Angela Bach, creative director of Bach Creative and former brand director of Supreme. And we're really lucky to be joined also by tonight's moderator, Nikki Oganaki. Thanks, Nikki, so much. Um, Nikki is the newly appointed digital director of Harper's Bazaar. Congratulations. So Nikki, I'm, I, we've got a lot of eager folks. I think over 500 will be joining literally from all over the world. Um, most of whom are our students, former scholarship winners, potential applicants and scholarship winners, alums and board members. So um, turning that group over to you, Nikki, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, it's yes. Oh my God, I'm so excited. I see people already dropping where mm-hmm. they are come, they're tuning in from in the chat. Um, We've got people from Brazil, we've got people from Illinois. If anyone else wants to like drop in um, where you're tuning in from, we would absolutely love to know. It's so exciting to have everyone here today. Um, Virgil, Angelo, I am so excited to talk to you guys. I have followed your careers for, I mean, forever. And you guys are, you know, the definition of innovators to me. Um, So I think for people who may not necessarily be familiar with your story though, why don't you tell me how, you two, some of the most influential men in fashion and streetwear um, met and how you started working together. Sure. Do you want me to take the lead on that, V? You gotta unmute. So anyway, since Virgil's muted, I'll just, I'll just take the lead. Um, Virgil and I have a, more than a handful of mutual friends when I worked at Supreme that were colleagues of mine. And, and that's kind of like when I first started hearing of Virgil's name and then like quickly became, you know, kind of like he was embraced by the Supreme family and he DJed for us for the Paris store opening. And then when I was ready to kind of move uh, move on away from Supreme, our first uh, for us, for the agency for Bakke Creative, um, our first big gig basically was coming up with the programming for the Virgil 10 uh, launch, which I think at this point was almost four years ago. Yeah. Uh, and, and then, you know, since then, you know, we've kind of like basically been, you know, I think more than colleagues, I, I feel like that's where it kind of developed into more of a friendship and, and, you know, like from time to time, just kind of like check in on one another, how each other is doing. So I, I guess the answer to that question has been, it's been more of an organic kind of friendship that's developed over the last like, you know, six to seven years. Yeah, for sure. It's really like, what's dope about how Angelo and I know each other. It's like, it's like a term borrowed from like corporate world that's completely far as like colleagues. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like when, when people work at different companies, you know, I was with Kanye like back more in that era. And it's like the brand of Supreme. It's like the brands were so prime that you knew that there were people that you didn't know on the surface level that obviously like, come from the same sort of depth. And um, I think obviously our circles sort of like combined, but really it was like, we were both like head in the sand. I think that's the most important like jewel for kids to first take away. It's like when you put your head in the sand and you like really work hard for whatever you're working on, like your name or your work will resonate. So I always knew Angelo from, friends of friends before we had met. And um, yeah, like the Nike 10, like super important project in my atmosphere. And that was in New York ideated by him. And then we also did social studies, which is his platform um, 
of the same similar sort of type of giving back, giving knowledge. We've done a couple activations around that. So yeah, it's just like, you know, in the same community, more importantly. Right. And then just to kind of connect the dots, like without us doing the programming for the Virgil 10, for if, you know, some kids don't know, like it was kind of like the first time that we brought in, let's say like teachers that teach workshop with regular kids, you know, but it's not just like academic teachers, but, you know, peers from, you know, from our industry, you know, uh, bringing in Shane and Ian from Hood by Air, Cali Thornhill do it. Um, you know, it just wasn't done at that, at that time. Um, and then doing the conversations based around uh, Virgil's design process around each silhouette that pretty much, you know, inspired social studies, you know, cause uh, just to, not to go too deep into it, you know, part of the part of the trickiness of working for corporations is that once you pretty much give them the sauce, they think that they could repackage it themselves and do it on their own without you. So I recognized that immediately with, with my creative partner, Shaniqua Jarvis at the time. I'm like, we need to do something for ourselves and continue this momentum of, you know, we realized that the magic of the Virgil 10, of course, was the design, the design that Virgil did, but it, it was more the interaction between these workshop teachers, professors, with like regular kids from the Bronx, Queens, Harlem, you know, like that's where the real magic kind of happened and trying to figure out like, how do we create transparency as, you know, POCs uh, in this industry and kind of, kind of, instead of giving it to the corporation for free, like give it to the kids for free. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. I think what has been so amazing about um, you two as well is that you've, you've really sort of collaborated and given people collaborations we didn't even know we needed. So, Virgil with Evian water, like I didn't know I needed off-white water and like, you know, <laughs> you got Supreme homeware and luggage, like who knew? I didn't know I needed all those things, but like as soon as they came out, it was a drop, I needed it, right? So I would love to hear from you guys, why do you feel that these sort of collaborations are necessary for the fashion industry, important for the fashion industry? And what do you think of the reaction to these, to these collaborations? Well, for me, for starters, I take like the long lens back, like to even approach that question, you have to sort of lay the context for that word that I ultimately have a love hate relationship, which is streetwear. Mm -hmm. you know, so if you just you think of it in quotes, but don't think of it as us using it in literal sense, like we're kids from the shop, right? We're kids from like a shop bench before this context even happens. Like, 20, 30 years ago, there were small skate shops or shops selling sneakers that this, that was like the fertile soil for what we see today. But Angelo and I are just like, we're, we're raised in that shop atmosphere, which is like you fold t-shirts, you sweep up, you just hang out. Like it's a skill set just to literally hang out. And, and with that came a bunch of brands. Like you put your brand name on a t-shirt, you sell it. Who knows, that store might have lasted for a few months, max a few years, then it goes out of business. So that cycle had been happening in New York and Japan and LA. Um, but basically it was like a small community. Mm -hmm. Fast forward to today, and, and we were all definitely wearing polo. <laughs> you know, like that, that goes without saying, it's like there's Ralph Lauren who you saw like Purple Label, Home, you saw him in outfits in Telluride, you know? And like, so that ambition to be like, we're here just making t-shirts and making community, but why can't we be big in our own way? And I think that that trait for me is the little bit like, it's hip hop, you know? Like if you see someone doing, or graffiti, you see someone doing one style, you're gonna try to do a different style in another way. And I think that's why, you know, you can't limit us to street, you can't limit us to a t-shirt, you know, you could, if, if it works on a shirt, it, there could be a water attached to it. What is the paint? What is the environment? But Angelo might have some bars on that. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Uh, the, the truth is back to the, to the question is we don't need any more product, right? There's no need for the luggage and the other things at this point. Um, I think kind of like echoing what Virgil is, is saying is really more about creating lifestyle, mm -hmm. right? Because hanging out in the store and creating like real community with your friends with like-minded people, like that's what that was about, right? So how do we expand on that lifestyle of community, right? That's, that's just what I was thinking. When I originally read that question, 
for me specifically with Supreme is not so much about the housewares and the luggage. It, it's really commodifying art where I think that I feel like now, like now that I'm apart from that brand for a few years, I kind of feel like that credit that hasn't really been given to that brand for like, for bringing like um, Jeff Koons and, you know, kind of like what would be, you know, like, you know, blue chip artists uh, to make tangible. Basically it, it became home goods because nobody really skated those skateboards. Everybody collected them and ended up hanging, hanging them in their, in their homes or putting them in a Christie's auction now. You know, so I, I think that's kind of an interesting um, kind of turn that the brand took and kind of bringing in something that wasn't really commodified besides the actual painting itself or the artwork. You know, and when I really, really think back, you know, the only person that I could think of that actually did that was Keith Haring when he had his, when he had his own store, you know, the pop shop. And you could actually get a piece of his artwork for $5. You could buy a little badge or a button and bring that home with you. So I think in a way like creating, you know, a, a Christopher Wool, you know, skateboard that's $88 is way more punk than, you know, a Ramoa luggage, you know? And I feel like that's kind of like the DIY spirit of as much as, you know, Virgil says he doesn't like the word streetwear. I don't like it either, you know, cause I think it's a bullshit term, but, um, you know, like to me, that that's really the essence of streetwear, which is, is kind of improvisation and, you know, just kind of using what you have in your environment and trying to create that new, like you, like Virgil's saying, like, you know, you want to outdo what the next person just did and you want to be innovative, but how do you, how are you innovative with $88? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And that's like, you know, there's so many routes and it's such a profound question as we answer that, like in 2020, where these brands are growing big, you know, it's like, where we've transitioned from the small shop that was just barely making it to now, you know, Shopify accounts that have kids with a brick of money on their ear, <laughs> like in two seconds. And it's like, I, that's why I love talking about it. Cause like when you, you have to dialogue just to know where we are. But I think one of the many profound things is what Angelo just mentioned about, you know, art or like commodifying, like how does someone, like who actually lives with blue chip artists versus who can afford them. But now a whole generation has been raised off of Supreme collaborations to know like a Damien Hurst or Jeff Koons or George Kondo, like, and now you actually see the art world having to shift to be able to sort of say, hey, we can make more money selling prints and skateboards than we can move hundred plus thousand paintings. And in, in that is us. It's literally the people in this room who have like grown up knowing how Supreme works, seeing off Pyrex go to off white, you know, like I've always said that streetwear is just a method of making. It's a mentality. It's not like, you know, it's not sort of easily boiled down. It's like, if you apply that to tech, if you apply that to food, if you apply that to giving back in the community, that same type of mentality that brought us from small shop to billion dollar companies can transform other industries alike. Yeah, I think where you guys have um, been able to succeed though and what you both have sort of talked about is this idea of community. And I think that community, you know, is, is a key factor in sort of being able to to move past just like a commodification of something like you're really creating you're bringing people together around an experience which i feel like is what you know the art world is trying to do by selling prints now or something of that sort so um but a thing i also want to talk about right now is that you know we are in a time of change with community we're in a time of social change um how are you managing to stay to stay connected to you know the people that are part of your community and also your audiences. Go for it. You want me to go? <laughs> <laughs> go Who first. wants to talk first? Who wants to go for it? Um, let's pick up the phone. Mm. You know, it's, it, it's that simple. You know, um, for me, my behavior went from texting to actually like really connecting and calling people again. Um, and really checking in how, how, you know, how are you, how are you doing? Um, because of COVID, I have time, you know, and Virgil's schedule is a hundred times more busier than mine. And, I, you know, I was on a plane four times a month averaging and, you know, my, the, the most valuable commodity, commodity I have today is time. 
you know? So like, that was kind of the beauty, at least for me for the first three months of COVID is to kind of be able to sit, be forced to sit and think and figure out like, what are my intentions? What, what is it that I want to put out through my work in the world? And then also just start tapping in and, and really reaching out into my community, like calling friends in London, calling friends in Paris or Berlin, like really taking 30 to 40 minutes to just like communicate and talk with people again and not just like sliding into someone's DM, like, yo, what's up? How you doing? You know, but like actually having like sincerity um, and, and yeah, man, I mean, that's that's pretty much it. Yeah, no, nah, same, you know, like community is, I think that's like, if you look at our story, like this sort of uh, whatever you want to call, there's like a first generation in in this idea of like, uh, you know, Angelo and I speaking on behalf of like the fashion industry is already like crazy in itself. <laughs> if you go back to where we were 10 or whatever years ago. And so what's important to me in the same essence is like making sure that there is a true like community that is of different descent within the spaces that we occupy, right? Like we have a, a similar social group of friends and friends of friends, but you know, making sure that there's seats at the table for other brands to exist, for other creatives to exist so that we can literally just like fulfill a destiny of being creative. Um, so, you know, we've used this year or I have in sort of like, you know, thinking about the approach and communication so that the next 10 years look different than the last 10. I think you're on mute. Okay, perfect. Um Virgil, I think that's really interesting. I feel like now is this time is a year that we've all sort of just had the time a to connect with our community, but also just really, you know, sit and think about like what we're doing um, and sort of, you know, where we are in the fashion world and how it relates to the future. Um, I would love to hear from both of you, though, like, where do you what do you think that this year of change means? And like, what do you think that having had this time to think like, what are your sort of hopes for the future of fashion? I hope that it becomes like off, uh, you know, it's like all these like grandiose terms and logics, you know, like you want it to, to represent the people that are less represented. We want it to, to mean something, you know, for me last year, I was like, just, you know, I was doing like a freestyle with a friend from Dazed and, and we were talking about consumption and everything. And I was like, uh, streetwear is dead. And then boom, my phone blows up and the world is like, wait, what did you say? You're not supposed to say that, like whatever. But you know, like we're, I, I like it because it's like, we're thought leaders. This is not, Angela and I aren't just like guys like selling t-shirts and then kicking our feet up, thinking that life is good. You know, like we we come from a race and we come from corners that aren't good and we're we're in fortunate positions. You know, we have our privilege, but we're we're constantly tweaking the design to make sure that the door is open for those that can't get in or can't have a voice or don't have resources. So it's like I think if you asked anyone from our crew of friends, whether it's Tremaine, who's Denim Tears, or Shaniqua, or myself, or Heron, or Asa, you know, the people that are, are close, like, that's what we've been about. Um, now that the world is like, the lens changed, of course, you know, it's like a microscope, but to me, it's like, continued mission, new resources to achieve the same goals. Yeah. Angela, do you want to add anything? Sure. I, I think you know, one of the things like, for example, like my personal experience in COVID was kind of like a stripping of resources, you know, which I, which I enjoyed, you know, it's like, I, I, I couldn't go into the office, you know, I didn't have interns to lean on, you know, like, and then I got to drop, you know, spring, summer 20. And I was just like, what the fuck am I going to do? You know what I mean? Like a lot of people, like, I don't have a backing. I don't have a trust fund. I don't, there's no secret money behind the brand. So, you know, like that's when you talk about like, how do you tap into community? I had no problem hitting up B or hitting up Tremaine or Chris Gibbs from Union to be like, what, do, what are you guys doing? You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, and then honestly, like get creative, 
you know, like kind of like the, the, the blessing in disguise for this year for me has just been like pushing, like because of the times, pushing to get creative all over again and not lean on the kind of resources that I had before. Um, and to like, kind of like almost like go back to the initial question, you know, with, with myself and Virgil and everyone that he name checked, like uh, we, we've been supporting one another for like the last five, six years, you know, and when the day when I was ready to leave Supreme, we kind of had like our own little secret meeting. It was like me, Virgil, Tremaine, and A-Side to kind of like, like how do we support each other as men of color in this industry? Because at the time, you know, five, six years ago, like we're still outnumbered, you know what I mean? And what I, what I realized is that, you know, we're not going to get anywhere unless we hold the line, you know? So if Nike comes to me and they're like, Hey, we got this, um, this thing like the virtual 10 project, uh, but we're only going to pay you 10 grand, but I know my going rate is 40. I'm going to hold that 40, which means like Tremaine, don't take the 10 because then you're going to ruin it for the rest of us. So we got to hold the line for each other as, as creators, specifically as creators of color, because that's how kind of corporations have won over the years, which is through, you know, divide and conquer, you know, and it ends up, they end up convincing us that we need to fight over the same piece of cheese. Like that's a billion dollar company. You know what I'm saying? Like you best believe they got 40 grand to pay up. You know what I mean? So like for us, it's just like, all right, not only that, then then how do how do we usher in the next generation? You know, like which you know Virgil was talking about too, because what we have in common, both of us, is kind of being, you know, being the first, right? The first in our families to pursue art careers, the yeah. the first, you know, men of color to kind of break through, you know, believe it or not, like for me, like being the only person of color or power at Supreme, you know, like Virgil being anointed at, you know, at LV. And I remember I was being baited once by an interview, an interview, I forgot for what magazine. And basically like, do you, like, for lack of better terms, like, do you think it's corny that Virgil got the LV position? And I was like, why would I think that? You know, like, this is what all the work has been done for. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, so why wouldn't I uphold him while he's in this position and vice versa? You know what I mean? Because the whole point is just that we, like, we create the seat at the table, but you're not closing the door behind you, you know, or shutting down the window. But it's just like, all right, like, the rest of y'all got to come in. Yeah. That's the only way there's going to be real change. You know what I mean? Because the biggest issue right now, not to go too far off on a tangent, is like there's a lot of like like corporate white sympathy dollars and hiring POC artists. But then like who's owning the companies? Who are the art directors? Who are the creative directors? Now, if they're still white, then like that's that's an issue. You know what I mean? Because there isn't really any change. It means that we're trending right now. You know what I mean? That's not that's not change. That's that's a trend. And I don't want, I don't want sympathy. I want change. Exactly. And that's why, you know, obviously you can see my platform is like, it, we're doing this, you know, like this means weekly. <laughs> this means Angelo's coming December 15th. And we're like, you're not going to find these jewels of information in any textbook, you know? And I love that the, the outward thing is like, yeah, we want to help. We want to give mentorship. We want to give we want to give like resources. We want to give even scholarship dollars. Like to me, it's the jewels of information. It's how to proceed. It's how, how do we actually implement change? And it's not things that are in a textbook and it's not one plus one. It's, it's legitimately, as Angelo said, like one of the people that we've both uplifted and we really cherish is Shane from Hood by Air you know, he was like amongst sort of the first wave of what we saw happen in the fashion industry. He was in Vogue. All the editors were at the shows. Hood by Air, you know, was, you know, getting off the ground. The, the, the infrastructure was barely there. Um, and it didn't, it didn't sort of come up with the same wave, but Angelo brings Shane in and Ian for the, the Nike 10. I'm building with Shane through the, the years in between because I think that he should be at a house at LVMH next to me or before me. So last week, private con, <laughs> well, I just realized how many people are in here. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, I'll, and I'm learning how to like speak for large amounts of people and not get in trouble the next day on the internet. Last week, when I'm in Paris sitting with the LV HR director for the whole company like over 30 60,000 employees or whatever the number is you better believe that I was <laughs> like one of the bullet points of the meeting was like who are you hiring for fashion houses because to me I have a list of people that I want to see sitting parallel to me you know it's it's literally 
this is the story of the Trojan horse of all of us that have banded together and said, okay, you like, you know, him at Supreme is super important. Me working where I was working and trying to like get Nike to believe it's like, it's, and this is the jewel, not to just run off on a tangent too, but like as the kids in here are developing your own craft, if you're not building with the other designers and other kids in your scene, if you don't look at Instagram and think it's a solo race, you know, don't look and think I want to get on Vogue or I need to get my, my stuff sold in Supreme or whatever. You have to sort of like be a crew, you know, you have to work together. You have to big, big up each other. And like, those are the hour, the practice hours that we've all done. And you can see that we're still like, we're still working on it just as much as we're working on the next drop or working on the next collection. It's like checking in, talking to each other, making sure that we're, we're thinking about it with a wide lens. Yeah, Virgil, I think you're completely right. And I think that um, for the students here, it's also good to know that you can stretch like outside of just design. So like, I know Shaniqua, I love Shaniqua, I love her work. So if I'm looking for a photographer to shoot something for bizarre.com, like I'm gonna go to Shaniqua. And it's just that, it's just about, you know, this idea my friend Joe says that like everybody can eat, like there's room for everyone. There's enough pie for everyone. So it's just all about bringing in your crew. Cause like, those are the people that you're gonna be able to create the best things with at the end of the day. Um, so I have two more key questions for you guys. Um, you know, as you sort of look back at your career trajectory, you have been able to achieve a lot of amazing things, but I'm sure there have been some pitfalls as well. I would love to hear from you two about your, your highs and your lows, your successes and your pitfalls. Angela, you go first. I've been wow. talking too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, boom, you got nah. Wow. <laughs> See, you got um, more than I do. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> like I got a yeah. I got a ton. Career pitfalls. Um this is gonna sound crazy. I don't I don't think I've had any career pitfalls. You know, like I've had a lot of career challenges. You know, uh, for example, like the last four years like starting you know my own clothing business with awake and then also simultaneously doing bucket creative uh it's been really difficult you know a bit you know I've, I've had my own kind of success so i i think um yeah i i you know like i don't regret any like every job i've done has been a grind you know i've been working retail since i was 18 you know like from 18 to 28 then i had supreme a 10-year run there and then the last four years i've been independent so like, I'd be lying if I'm like, oh, I did this and that was a mistake. You know, like, it's just, you know, I've been interning since the age of 16 and just kind of like busting my ass to kind of get where I'm at right now. So I, I don't know, I don't know, honestly, you know, like when I hear career pitfalls, it's like, oh, I should have never left Supreme or I should have never worked at that store or, you know, I regret that I didn't do this. Like, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful that I've actually, I've had a good run and support over the last, you know, 20 plus years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it's a similar answer because like and it's a great question because a lot of us I'm sure once we get to the questions in the the room we always look at where we want to go is like if we only had this mm. you know like if I only had an investor at 17 then would my brand would have my early brands been better or whatever or if I only was born in this city instead of you know I was born in Rockford Illinois instead of New York City during the the heyday and I like I in a similar fashion I think what I've learned obviously I've had pitfalls you know like certain ideas don't hit um but I don't I don't keep a score system that sort of like tangible and you know like that so obviously my brain is like creative and I'm looking at a bitter, bigger picture and I'm trying to represent myself you know in an industry obviously where there's not too many like black people, people of color that have like gone down this path. So in essence, it's about legitimately just learning, but also realizing those things that I like fought against that I don't have to carry them for forever. Like that's like a bigger, you know, like I, I, I found out when I was speaking about my work in the beginning, I was always talking about like, yeah, like I couldn't create because people didn't think that I was a designer. They thought that 
I was just the consumer, you know, I should be in Louis Vuitton, like buying a wallet that I could never, and that, that block in my brain literally was fig figurative, but it became real, mm. you know, luckily I had this, like, put my head in the sand and just work that I was able to break through a wall that I had built up and I reinforced that for myself. So the jewel is just that, like, be careful of the boxes that you're creating, you know, be, be careful of the wall that you're saying, I need this to then go there. Like, just analyze that, use this downtime to sort of be like, wait, is it really there? Can I, can I go around it? Does, you know, and then you start like thinking in a different dimension. Yeah, I think we're often quick to place ourselves into boxes or edit ourselves or, you know, twist ourselves into thinking that we have to be these certain things when like other people didn't even ask us to be that, but we were <laughs> anticipating or thinking that that ask would come. Um, so that's an amazing jewel that you, you just dropped. It's really thoughtful. Um, you know, I think you guys this evening have dropped so many amazing gems, but I would love to know um, if you had to give this group like one, you know, big sort of piece of advice um, when it comes to starting their own brand, what would you say? I'm going to just go back to that last question real quick, and I promise it'll connect to this one. <laughs> um, part of the reason why, like, I feel like I haven't really had like a pitfall, I don't know, when I hear pitfall, I think of a mistake is like just trusting my gut. And I, and I feel like, you know, you kind of, you, you have to trust your, and you know, that little voice, that little nagging voice you hear in your head, you know, like, don't do that. Or maybe you should do that. You know, maybe the, you should color the shirt purple, you know, whatever, whatever, like <laughs> trust it. Because the worst thing that can happen is that it comes out whack, but that might be the best thing for you. Because what I think about is just like how silly I looked in my 20s. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't give a shit how I dressed. I just, you know, maybe <laughs> maybe for argument's sake, my, my outfits were whack. Maybe my haircut was whack. You know what I mean? But like, I wouldn't, you know, if I didn't try, you know, to be different or do things differently, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. So, you know, like back to what Virgil was saying about Instagram and being influenced by social media, like I'm guilty of it too, because I feel like sometimes we're all in the same algorithm. You know, I'm like, oh, I can't believe... I did, you know, the same t-shirt graphic that Virgil did, but I'm like, but if we're listening to the same music, we're looking at the same art, watching yeah. the same TV shows, like yeah. the likelihood that we're going to design the same like flannel shirt is like 90%. <laughs> literally, you know what I'm saying? We walked into the Zoom like, you know? <laughs> like, oh snap, like, you know, should one of us change? And but it's like, <laughs> we're on the, we're surfing the same algorithm. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's, that would be my main advice is like, you know, it's good to have people that tell you like, hey, you look whack because that's a good <laughs> friend. You know what I'm saying? But like, tr just trust your gut, trust the instinct because that really, I feel like with all my friends that I trust that, you know, Virgil was talking about kind of like our, like our circle of peers, like yeah. <laughs> they, they kind of all live by the same code. You know, we all, we all kind of, you know, yeah. march to the drum of our own beat. <laughs> no, exactly. As we get into the last, because uh, I'm excited to get into questions so we don't run too long, mm -hmm. but just uh, like just what's top of my mind, like top of my desk um, that relates to your question is don't really fall into this. Or, or it's, it's obvious. There's no wrong answers, right? Like that's, but when I say that piece of advice, I feel like it's too kumbaya. <laughs> you know, it's like everyone believes that it doesn't really mean anything, but let's make it like grounded in reality, it's that, oh yeah, top of my desk. So I'm dropping this LV skate shoe. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, that's my latest sort of, you know, two and two years in the making, which Angelo knows it's like, you know, skate might be the most sacred space amongst all the niche pop culture. You can't just enter that space. You can't just operate. So on the weekends, I don't know if you can tell, like I've just been watching all the old skate videos that I watched when I was 17. Just like remembering like that's, you know, I've been skating since I was 17. I've been obviously a black skater. So I've known where like black people have been represented in that. And then you see the influence of skate now and like Supreme obviously ushered in like the next generation of black skate icons in a totally different atmosphere. And the most important thing is progression, right? When you see how these sports exist, like someone does something and then someone across the world can do it. And if they see it on video, that changes the sport for forever. 
I was like, you know, I was like, this progression shouldn't feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like you shouldn't, it shouldn't be like, when you're breaking a barrier, you're setting up something new or for you guys in the chat, like if you're building a brand and you're like, all my friends think it's whack, but I really want that shirt to be purple. Like you breaking through that sort of unpopular opinion for a second will make the next sort of pillar of design. And so that's like, just trust your gut and like go with it. Like, you know, like that shoe has to come out. Like there has to be a black skater at the head of a fashion house for the first time, just because we have the power in our hands to do that. Um, so that's my wave. Yeah, Virgil, I want to say that I also love what you're doing with Daily Paper in Ghana as well. I'm like so excited to see that project come out and that's very inspiring. Um, there are so many amazing questions in this chat right now. It's like, ooh, it's very lit. Um, I, th I think for me, something that I find really interesting that a lot of people have been asking is, how do you know when not to collaborate or to not take that step, um, maybe with a brand? And then how do you prevent it? How do you prevent your own brand from becoming just a commodity? You want me to take the lead on that you too? Go. Yeah, swing at that pitch. <laughs> swing at that pitch. <laughs> you got it. You got to be honest with yourself. You got to say, you know, am I am I supposed to make this North Face jacket? Am, am I supposed <laughs> to do this this Reebok shoe? Am, you know, like what you know, like you have to be your own best gauge of what is true to you and your brand. You know, it's you can't you can't base it on the check. You know, like because um, the truth is like your brand integrity and your authenticity. At least for me, I'll, I'll talk about myself. There is no price on it. You know, so like it's it's not it's not a million dollars. It's not five. It might be fifty million. Who knows? You know what I mean? But like, as of right now, you know, I've worked so hard to have my brand be true to me, awake. You know, like it's it's my it's it's my baby. You know that if I don't think it's right, yeah, it's you know it's back to what I was talking about, like really trusting your your inner voice and your inner truth, um, because the the truth is, you know, the the right collaborations, the right partners will come to you. You know, just based on the work that you're putting out yourself in the world. You know, and, and then you should also have an idea of what you want to create with your brand, with, with other people. Yeah, and just to add on to that, like, like Angelo said, like, we're sort of first in our zone, right? Like, we didn't exactly grow up with like, you know, there was Dapper Dan, but that was before my time and like a specific, had I been closer, that probably would have been my sort of like knowing where to go. I was just into skaters and DJ, you know, like hip hop DJs or something like that. Uh, and I wore polo to death. And I was looking at Ralph Lauren being like, how, how can I even get near that space? And so, and yeah, it's just like the, it's that, that idea of just sort of pushing towards like the role you want to be and collaboration is obviously second nature to how I work. You know, I grew up in an era where collaboration wasn't cool. Um, but how else was I supposed to get anyone to talk about my project? You know, like those years of Off-White or Pyrex that wasn't written in any American editorial magazine, wasn't in, and it wasn't getting any attention. I was like, oh, if I collaborate with this, then there's something to talk about. And that got me off the ground. So it's my language, but the sort of my end goal is that collaboration is just a modern language. You know, it's conversation. Like I have a brand DNA, I can talk to Evian. I have a brand and DNA, I can talk to Mercedes. I'm just betting that there's no rules. <laughs> so that means there are no rules. And it's like me, as the creative, I have different entities to collaborate. Like I look at my work, of course, my I'm the artistic director of Louis Vuitton, which technically would put me under there. But in my mind, Louis Vuitton is collaborating with me 365 days a year. I don't care how big that brand, well, I, you know, we'll see how you, see how you guys are gonna hype this tomorrow. <laughs> but you, you get where my train of thought is going. And and that's the that's what I'm trying to, you know, that's the methodology that I'm bringing to this group is I really feel that way. Um, next question. 
<laughs> you oh, know what? Let, let, let me add something to that real quick yeah. too. Yeah. The, the truth is, and you could disagree with me, Virgil, collaborations don't mean anything anymore. anymore. Yeah. You know, it, it, don't, it, it don't mean it. Let's be for real. You know what I'm yeah. saying? So like that, like that shock value, like, oh my God, I can't believe brand X collaborated what I, with brand. What I've X. seen this week already, just what, like each week. You know what week. I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. So for, for me, you know, my approach now is just like, what is the intention behind the collaboration? Like, what is it besides making like a tangible good? Like what, what purpose can we bring? with this good you know which is like for me like with the work that i've done with awake is you know like really bring some type of consciousness into streetwear you know so it's like we can kind of elevate this idea of collaboration for the greater good so like you know that's something that you know as i was listening to virgil speak you know like you know i think honestly after like the supreme Vuitton collaboration is like okay you know it's like <laughs> it's, used to be angelo, that it's actually angelo that ruined it for everybody else <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, you no, know, that was he, a bit of a mic drop for sure. It was like, right, you know, well, hey, yeah, you know, you so did it. Just, I know. Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, remember that term jumping the shark, you know, yeah, exactly. it's like, <laughs> jump the shark. And then, so not, you know, like, so, all right, so how do we elevate this? You know yeah, what I mean? And, that, and that's really, that's really on us. And we're going to call ourselves creatives to really kind of like push the idea of what a collaboration is. Yeah. And that, like it's worthy to sit on this question for a little bit longer. Cause that's like the title like we're probably known as collaboration gurus for his work from obviously mine, but- What's next, I think. There's, and there's also 300 kids in here. Like what I think, like collaboration now is like 7.0. And like like this, I see one of the homies, Sonny in here wearing the Stussy t-shirt that I did. To me, that was like a, it's like a, I called it like a, to Tremaine, our friend, I was like, this is a 4D collab because it's like four times of a collaboration in one object. <laughs> and I was like doing this trick to myself. I was like, all right, how can I get this idea off? Number one, it's printed by the first black screen printer that I ever made any garment with ever before Pyrex. He printed the production. So I called Milan of my company and Stussy. And I said, you guys aren't going to print the product. That production is going to go to a black screen printer that started my career. There's artifacts, graphics on the tees of like ancient objects in music, like in institutional thinking. And I started a foundation that takes back African uh, artifacts and puts them back into the country's hands. Like it doesn't allow them to be sitting at the Met or at so-and-so, you know, it's like an institution. So that's that. Um, then there is like how they were sold, like money from the actual sale of the tea goes to the postmodern scholarship fund. And then there's another one that I'm blanking on, but you kind of get the, like, and so I'm only telling that story, not because I hate talking in granular pieces about myself, but that's where the new vein that you guys are going to take this industry 7.0, no more of just like shocking brand or shocking item like impress me with how it gives back or how deep you thought about it then i'm literally gonna buy it because i'm like engaged into your logic because if you're just doing shock value or like oh i didn't expect reebok to do that old silhouette like it's not interesting to of course it's fine that should be what your career gets built up on but you'll take my job if you start thinking <laughs> 5D, which you should. That's why we're here breaking it down. Yeah, Virgil, I think it all goes back to sort of what you had said earlier in the conversation about this idea of a Trojan horse. And like that looks, you know, surface level, that looks like a t-shirt, but you just broke it down into four different ways that you've sort of been able to do all these different things in like a white tee. And that's like, that's pretty yeah, Open. the last one was yeah. the photographer. It was his first, and that was the that was an essential part. It gets long winded. That's why you know, like you see me trying to type the caption on Instagram. It's like reckless. But the for kid who shot the lookbook, which is equally important in our industry, it's like all these images of hip hop culture, our culture. That if it's not going through the lens, or some kid is not getting his name on the photo credit, to for another brand to call them up that's a missed opportunity to to you know for somebody else so think about that when you guys are planning your lookbooks like you know calling your friend 
putting them on, having them shoot the vid- him or her shoot the videos, and like that's streetwear 2020 to me. More questions from the squad. Yeah, I want to see what else is happening in here. Um, oh, interesting. Okay, so for aspiring creative directors who may not be hands-on creatives, what advice can you give to those people who still want to join in this, want to be a part of this industry? What does that mean? <laughs> well, <laughs> you got to be hands-on if you're trying to be a creative. Like that's what you. I'll tell you. That's what you're messing up in the first place. You know, like. <laughs> you got to have some type of vision and some type of voice, you know, like for me, you know, just my, my experience, I went to the school of visual arts for photography, you know, like Virgil, he went to school for engineer design. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, and then, so like I, I ended up where I ended up, you know, I still take pictures to this day, but I needed some type of foundation, like kind of foundation education to be able to apply, you know, the photography, you know, interning at magazines, uh, you know, you know, photo editing, you know, I had to learn all these skills in order to like bring that together. For example, for a job at Supreme, where I was able to kind of take all these life skills that I had gained through experience, you know, so like, it took me years at Supreme before I could take credit as like an art director for like, pretty much the photo shoots I was conceptualizing, you know, or like campaigns I was conceptualizing, you know, so like, I, I don't know what kind of creative director you're going to try and be and being laissez-faire, you know, being hands off, like I, I, good luck, you know, but you, you definitely need some, some type of vision and a voice. And, you know, if you're going to be as hands off as possible, then you best have a really great right hand that can kind of, <laughs> that can execute for you. But you know, that, that will only last so long. You know what I mean? Like I, I predict your career will last about 24 months. Um, that's, and that's what I've witnessed you know, in the 20 some odd years in this industry. Yeah, and a little bit of it's piggybacking off what he's, uh, Angelo saying is that, you know, these are jewels for the, everyone who tuned in. So it's like, here's an advance, here's the cliff notes of like information. Everyone that I've seen successful in this industry, which <laughs> Supreme has a lot of graduates that are really good at this. Every, every studio that I've been a part of, it's one thing, they came to the job with like full knowledge about something from their, their culture or the, whether it's photography, art, architecture. And they, they, it was like almost something that you had to study in school. That was like what you were super passionate about but you didn't know how it applied to what, you're, what you like doing after school. That always becomes like the leg up. Like in my first job working with Ye, it was architecture. Like I could tell in, in uh, Peter Saville, I just nerded out about Joy Division album cover. So all of a sudden when it's time to do Yeezus and everyone was on Photoshop trying to like make a cover, I was at Printed Matter, like buying zines, being like, yo, this is how, this is what I know of like art. It's kind of like these handmade zines. And then what did I do? I went back to the studio with like 20 zines and then the album cover just became an orange sticker on a CD. And that was me, if I hadn't had that like passion just for something else outside of rap, outside of the obvious, that moment of us making a great piece of artwork wouldn't have come to the table. So it's literally all the stuff that you grew up with, like where you're from, like if you're from a small town, that gives you a leg up on some kids in New York because you're thinking about it from a different perspective. So like foster that and nerd out on it and carry it with you. Don't try to like play it to the background. Mm-hmm. Um, I, a question that I think is really interesting. Um, someone wants to know, so when considering creating opportunities for underrepresented communities, should um, we as young people be thinking about um, increasing representation at places that already exist, existing brands, or should they be forging their own paths and trying to um, restructure the industry from the bottom up? So I, I think for, for me, that's a two prong answer. The first one, yes. You know what I mean? If you, get, you could get an opportunity to, to work in a predominantly white company, go for it. You know, but I, I think the real power, um, and I'll use myself for, as an example with Awake, I, I, I try my best to like nurture POC talent and then put also higher, you know, POC in order to, 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 you know, that's really the only way like back to the beginning was like 
how we're going to have shift and change. You know what I mean? So like in the era that I grew up in, in the late nineties and early two thousands, like <clears throat> when I was running around, you know, doing errands, when I, like I interned at the Source Magazine, um, you know, they would send me to like the Aniche office or the Rockware office or the Mecca or FUBU, whatever it was, it was, it was predominantly black and brown. Like those, those businesses, you know, hired POC. And somehow from that point on till now, that kind of dissipated, you know? So like it did exist at one point, but at the helm, those, co those companies were owned by, you know, by POC, you know? So like, you know, it's not, it's not on Palace or Supreme or Stussy that they're owned and run by white people. You know what I'm saying? Like that's exactly what has happened, but we can start creating the change by like exactly, the, I guess like the objective of this conversation is to help start creating that shift and change. So the objective is to empower you, the 300 and, you know, 16 people on this, uh, on this Zoom call to create your own businesses in order to, you know, have, you know, like, you know, when you see like those chart, like the family trees with the roots and stuff like that, like, <laughs> it's on you to start your own tree with your roots. So you're like, yo, I put such and such on, I put this kid on, you know, like, and then they put that person on. It, it's, you know, it's almost like, like a, like a good healthy triangle. So, you know, like, a, what is it like? A, like, what is it? Those like uh, Amways, you know, <laughs> like a, a pyramid scheme. Like, <laughs> That's a good kind. But the healthy, <laughs> but the, the, but the healthy, like the healthy pyramid scheme, you know. And yeah. I want to reiterate the point is it's like, let's not even overthink it right i always had the saying when i started one of the first off-white graphics was the youth will always win right like inherently the younger generation it's your turn like that's the whole point point. and systems are like made by people that are in positions for gener like longer than you've been alive someone could have been sitting at this exact job talking about this is how we used to hire. This is what sells in, in stores. This is what the advertising campaign needs to look like. And, and what why streetwear in quotes is important. In our lifetime, we started shifting the paradigm. You know, like in our lifetime, things have been sliding. And, and now it's your turn to sort of literally solidify, like, you know, there's people who started businesses like through Shopify accounts, I swear that are selling more than, you know, like brand, obviously they're calling you, they're asking you guys to post <laughs> their stuff. You're getting targeted by the algorithm. So there's no right answer. You should try to work, build your career, bounce around, gain knowledge, but then think about your own at the end of the cycle or think about the position you deserve. Mm -hmm. That's really, that's a really great answer. Um, another key, another common question that's popping up is, um, you know, both of you guys are able to handle so many creative projects at once. And so the audience wants to know, A, how do you do it without losing creativity, um, with, like without losing creative energy, but then also how do you do it with, um, without losing um, the integrity of all of the things that you're working on? You want to take the lead on that, V? <laughs> quick. Uh, yeah, I'll make it quick so we can get through a bunch. Like, to me, it's one big practice, right? I think it's it's almost becoming more apparent the longer that I work. And the cross-pollinization is what makes them mine. You know, that's my process. I'm not, I like being busy, you know? I like being, but it's personality driven, you know, like, I, I don't imagine that everyone has the same sort of like wacky sleep schedule that I do and OCD about culture and design. But I love if I'm working on a, uh, you know, I'm, I'm launching a magazine, uh, like a black art magazine, people of color, that's like just like where young artists can sort of show their work without having to explain themselves about why it looks the way it does. But I'm also doing like a new Jordan. So, in my conversation while doing one thing, I'm looking at the shoe and all of a sudden I'm like able to apply a logic over there to something completely opposite, which kind of gives me clarity rather than if I only had one thing on my desk and I was just staring, trying to make a shoe, I wouldn't be thinking about why is that Jordan shoe important? What did Michael Jordan mean to, you know, to a culture at the time? And that 
is just my method. I think the, the my answer to that question is find your own method of what sort of fuels you. Do not like try to adapt to other methods. Mm -hmm. uh, I come from the school of less is more. Uh, and so, you know, for example, when I first left Supreme, you know, when I started the agency, um, I took the advice of someone that also had left a bigger company in the last, you know, couple of years. And, and they kind of taught me this jewel, which was, you know, when they first left, they took on as much work as they could handle, right? They took on, you know, 10 to 15 clients. And what he noticed that by the time he submitted all the work, it was, it was, it was kind of mediocre, you know, self-admittedly. He was, and what I found is, you know, if I could just take three clients and work really hard on those three clients and kill it, it'll naturally, one, keep them coming back for more work and it'll attract other clients at the same time. But it's kind of figuring out what kind of people do you want to work for or work with? You know, so I, I kind of took that model and that mentality and kind of applied it to, you know, to with Awake now also. And, you know, with, with the agency, you know, the worst thing you could do for us, right, you know, is to put some whack work out. You know, like there, there's, there's no there's no coming back from doing from doing a whack project. You know what I mean? Like, and that kind of defeats the purpose of, of putting the work out. You know, like it, it's different if you design like a whack hoodie or whatever, like that happens, you know, when you're working on your own collection, but it's something different when, you know, like imagine that yeah. Virgil 10 project, like nine of those were <laughs> oh, bricks. Yeah, we, I wouldn't have even been be invited to speak. We wouldn't be having this conversation right now <laughs> if that project was a brick, you know what I mean? But Virgil, you know, killed all 10 silhouettes, you know? So, you know, for me, like, you know, I just put out an ASICS literally last week and I, I'm proud of it. You know what I, I mean? Like, I, colorway I, bu it. <laughs> yeah, I, bu I busted my ass on that. And, you know, for a reason, it's just like intention, hard work, focus, and like, don't operate from a place of fear. Cause what that is, is just fear. Like I got to take on these 20 projects cause I got to make this amount of money. Like if you're going to be money driven, you know, there's an expiration date on that, you know, but if you really are going to be, be driven by the art, like, like you got to have faith in your own creativity that you're going to be taken care of and that, you know, you'll be, you'll be able to, there'll be more projects basically. That's really great. Um, I think a, um, one sort of last question that I think is really important. Um, people are asking about mental health and they're also asking about dealing with the pressure um, of, you know, feeling like you have to crank out all of this work or that you, um, you know, have to be the next hottest, whatever sort of thing. So how do you guys deal with the pressure and how do you make sure that you maintain like a positive sort of uh, mental health status? I think that, I think we're actually at a breaking point. You know, I, you know, 2020 is not a, a global pandemic. Isn't something to just like hope that world gets back to partying and traveling so things can get back to normal. I think that this is like a tremendous opportunity to set a new trend, you know, using the word trend, but a new like way of operating, you know, like wellness, like, the algorithm is like really what you have to watch out for, like making sure that you're not completely swept away in this sort of like digital stream that you don't like, like walk around your block and realize like who actually lives next to you in that environment and having that balance. Um, you know, I, I would like to see, you know, like when I said that comment, streetwear is dead, the next sentence that got cut off of that is I was just talking about consumption. Mm. You know, it's like, how many more hoodies can I have? Like, of course I produce hoodies, but that doesn't mean that I'm kicking my feet up, like, like at least questioning or thinking. And, I've, uh, you know, I've incorporated a sustainability aspect in both LV and Louis uh, Off-White, but still like I'm, I'm grappling with these things that it's like, I'm, I want to see the world be a better place, you know, at the end of, of creating in it. So I think you have to sort of take the world at your own pace, you know, be careful of comparing your life to someone else that you follow as a metric of like, am I successful? Because obviously those things are slippery and they change all the time. Mm -hmm. Angelo, you got a vibe? Yeah, well, compare and despair is, is what I call it. You know, that, you know, and that, that's, just, <laughs> that's a straight, you know, kind of like social media thing, uh, which I, you know, I'm guilty of myself, you know, I fall prey to that, but, um, Back to, to the question, you know, when I, when I think of, of mental health and, and uh, 
wellness, you know, specifically for men of color, we're taught to not speak how we feel, right? We have to swallow trauma. We have to swallow depression. We have to swallow mental illness. We have to swallow um, systemic racism, you know? So my first, my first piece of advice was like, you know, would be like, it's okay to ask for help. And it's, and it's okay to be vulnerable and it's okay to get honest, you know, like talk to, you know, talk to your, you know, fellow friend, whether female, male, them, they, you know, like we, we all got our own bags and, and kind of like our own traumas that, you know, we've, we've been, at least I was taught to just shut up, you know what I mean? And then for example, like just, just work, shut up and work, you know? Um, so for me, like the first key was, you know, therapy, uh, meditation, prayer, you know, um, and I'm not the most religious person, you know, but I am a spiritual person. And, you know, that's kind of like when you hear of like all like great musicians and artists, you know, they're always talking about a higher power, right? They're always, you know, like whether it be God or Ja or, you know, you know, whatever, you know what I mean? Like there's always, you know, for me, like I have no issue asking for help. You know, and and that I, I would feel like that's been kind of like the next breakthrough for me as a man, as a, a man trying that's still maturing at the age of 42. And so like call like Chris Gibbs, you know, like at the height of COVID being like, yo, I'm, yo, I'm shook. Like, wh like, what are we going to do? You know what I'm saying? And then George Floyd happens, BLM is happening. You know, so many things are happening that is just like, yo, like, are you OK? You know, like even recently, you know, with the, the days prior to, you know, Biden being, you know, finally announced the victor, you know, all our friends, we were bugging out, you know, because we've seen so much happen in our lifetime, you know, like, you know, so that's where we go back to the community and really nurturing and, and helping one another through through honesty and vulnerability. That's yeah. fantastic. Before, you know, I have, a, I have a patented thing. This has now become my signature. So Peter and Alyssa, you have to bear with me. But I, I only do these Zoom things if they're actually like valuable, which means that unless I hear from some of these kids and adults within this room, do I get a sense that we've actually connected? So it becomes disorganized fast, but we'll do six quick questions from the crowd starting now. So you just have to one at a time and go. I have a question. You struggle with on a day to day basis. All right. Hello. Start Hi. over. Start over again. Hi, Virgil. <laughs> what is something you'd say you struggle with on a day to day basis? And how do you suggest you to overcome that one thing, like creatively? The only thing that I'm struggling with. It's a little bit like I used to travel so I could have my feet on the ground. And, and understand like what real people are exchanging about. Right now, there's like a dissonance. Um, I don't know, I think I just turned 40. So I'm, my mind is like, I've been doing this. I'm starting, to, I'm starting to understand what like all of my mentors went through as they started like aging in their practice. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm now like less careless as I used to be able to be when I had like, a hundred thousand followers on my Instagram or something. Mm. I could post whatever I want. I could say whatever I want, um, but now I can't. Um, next question for Angelo. Yeah. Go. The, yeah. Um, oh, basically, oh, um, hello, hello, Angelo. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So basically, um, I have a brand called um, God's Glitch. We deal with um, limited um, runs um, of our pieces. Um, what I would like to do, what I, my question is, um, I sell it at like high end value. I sell a tracksuit for like 250 um, UK pounds. Um, my, my goal as a company is to donate 10% of our profits to, to less fortunate. Um, my question would be, do you think that's a bad thing to do it, because I'm trying to create a high end brand or would you say it's a positive thing to do? I think it's a positive, you know, and I think, you know, when, when you start working with bigger brands and corporations, then that's already in your brand DNA. So for example, if you're going to do like a, like a Reebok workout, you're like, okay, like if you want to work with me and my brand, this is what we have to do, which is what I'm doing now. You know, like, so the example has already been made. You start where you're at right now, which isn't, you know, you're just kind of like at the, 
you know, like at the very beginning uh, of your brand. So yeah, once once you once you get in a position of, of power, basically, when these corporations want to work with you, like it, it's already, you know, it's, it's part of the language and the DNA mm -hmm. of your brand. So the answer, it's a very positive thing. And I, and I wish you all the luck. I want you to, I want you to win. Thank you. Right, next you. up, Joyce. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Joyce. Okay, I have a question. How I'm going to do it, I'm going to call out on certain people. That'll make it easy. Joyce, we got yeah. women too. Like We want to hear from your perspective. Okay, so my question is, um, do you feel like urban brands like FUBU, who are, were known back then as like black clothing brands, were, were they the ones who, who set the tone for subculture brands like, I mean, well, subculture streetwear brands like Supreme to, fl um, to flourish in the global fashion market? <laughs> I'll, I'll jump, like, I'll make a quick, I think, I think it's really important that like a young generation like your guys, I assume, like really revisits exactly what Angela was talking about. There was a there was brands like Mecca and Nietzsche, Echo, uh, uh, not Echo, but you know, like that sort of pocket that it was celebrated and they were sort of leaning on each other, you know, like they were growing and that was on the top sphere. I know that they were selling like really well and there was a community at a top level and then all of a sudden when they went down then that kind of camaraderie came apart in the streetwear level but i think it's in a that's like that's a huge like uh, like as a community we can build that again you know knowing that that existed in the past oh also joyce there were a bunch of smaller brands from from the late 80s and early 90s that probably had more of an influence on how Supreme approach design, you know, coming from America and also from Tokyo. So, you know, like I would say, you know, like how there's, you know, like how we have like an independent music scene and we have kind of like, you know, like the pop, you know what I mean? So like by the time like Rockaware and FUBU and all these brands were like, they were kind of like pop, you know what I mean? Everything else was kind of, they weren't really considered subculture at the time. But they were considered like black, they were considered like black wear. So that wouldn't be a subculture. Nah, because if you get at Macy's, it ain't subculture. But all the black people wearing it, though. Yeah, no, they were black-owned businesses. But the if question what? you asked me if, if, that if it was a sub, it wasn't. A, it wasn't really a subculture. Stussy was a Macy's too, dog. Yeah. Once again, but but at, at that time, Stussy wasn't a subculture. They they've worked the last ten years to kind of like reel it back in. Well, kind of. I think all those all those brands. Oh, touch, Dante! Touch me. What yeah, up? Yeah. Well, first of all, Dante, bro, this is the guy right here that should be giving the lesson about early '80s, early '90s. <laughs> Dante was was an influential designer at that time. Um, you know, when we talk, we could talk about academics. We could talk about ten deep. You know, like it's a whole other class, a whole other day. But Dante, you're absolutely yeah. right. But I guess the point, like, without getting into the PNBs and you know. Uh, yeah. EOS and Ujima, which is just like right. Those are the, those like those are that was that those was were the uh, forefathers. Those were the forefathers yeah. of black-owned businesses in the early right. 90s that inspired the meccas and the fubus. You know, right? Amazing, exactly. my brother. Love. Yeah, you, I, I love you, Dante. I love seeing you. You know it's all love, baby. You know that. <laughs> yeah, Angela man. was shook because you thought someone was <laughs> checking your information. Yeah, I was like, yo, I had I had wow, a that's my, that's the young quick. dog right there, man. <laughs> that's the young that's dog. My, that, Dante's my OG. <laughs> that's the young dog, man. I love him. Love no, him. Thanks, how, Dante, way, for pulling up. Yeah. 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 Way, Respect to you too, Virgin. Keep kicking ass, man. Yeah, blood, love. I just I just want to call out real quick. You see how that works? Everybody is an OG. Dante's yeah. my OG. <laughs> Bless us, dog. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Go yes, quick. Yes, yes, so question. basically, Actually, I have a question. Yeah, and, and in terms of that, like a fashion have... publication. Oh, Jesus, okay. this is really tough. Let me go. Designing community. Really quick. Let Let really quick yeah just pick one someone yeah just pick somebody so basically uh, Naida, i, I feel question. like how do you yeah. Yeah. Uh, pick i got your you career Naida, 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 uh, Naida, Naida, Naida. 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 thank you hi <laughs> <laughs> hi it's Nataya. nice to meet you and thank you for making all of this zoom mentorship happened um very grateful but i have a question on how do you kickstart your um career as in in the creative business in the fashion world because I've had sort of like sorry coming relating back to me but I have like um I've been backed by 
well, my degree is fashion design with textiles and I'm trying to collab with my friends who's a photographer and things like that. And I have like ongoing solo projects going on. And I think relating back to what you've said earlier within this Zoom call that you have to be really passionate with what you love because otherwise it wouldn't last. And in terms of trying to balance having a balanced life with earning enough money to be able to fund your creativityness to buy all the materials and things like that do you think this is sort of like a good way yeah like essentially i get the the point of like the the early days of your career are going to be a struggle with like <laughs> how much money can you put into your yeah. passion versus like feeling like you need that to get to the next level and the short answer is like that struggle is the brand you know <laughs> yeah like don't think you have to move through it to then get to where you have to be. It's like creating with limited means will make your brand much better and it makes its story personal to you. Like you don't, it, it's of course, it's like a practical nightmare of like, I don't have money to buy fabrics. I can't, I can't get this Riri zipper from Japan that I think I need, or I can't screen print, or I can't do this, or I don't have a Nike collab or an ASICS collab or something like that. But that's the barrier to entry. As soon as you, as soon as you set your mind, then you start changing your ecosystem. Like, and and I formally believe that like don't start a brand until you've started some sort of reason for it existing, and, and having yeah. some sort of community aspect to it. It should be something that you and your friends are wearing, or you and your music, or you know, like it needs to come from the yeah. bottom up. All right, Malik, you got a question, sir. All right, well, first I wanna thank you Virgil and Angelo for having us. I think it's important to democratize the fashion industry. So that's exactly what you guys are doing. Um, I think my question is, well, I got a plan to start my own brand in 2021, but man, like I'm from New Jersey. So obviously I got quick access to New York, but like just my friend circle, I don't have a lot of fashion minded people. So I think my question is like, when yeah. I do launch the brand and when I start releasing product and stuff, how do I network and kind of like build a fashion minded community where I actually have people to talk to and people to sell to really? And well, I, I think yeah, I was about to say, you got the easiest tool right in your hand, you know, like you got, you got a cheat sheet more than me and Virgil ever had, you know, like yeah. what you can do like in two seconds, used to take us like three months of like knocking on, like literally knocking on doors, like, yo, let us, you know, let me in. Can I, you know, can I make photocopies for you? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so like, you're at the point where like, if you, you see somebody that's kind of pulling the same references that you're like, yo, what's up? You know? I mean, like, I sometimes like I'll hit up a kid that has 1500 followers and be like, yo, do you want to do some graphics for awake? You know what I mean? Like, so for me, it's just like, there's, there's no shame and just like cold, like cold call hitting people. Cause y'all do it to me all the time. You know, what I'm saying? Like, well, you know, so I can only imagine, you know, for, for Virgil, but you know, like honestly, like one out of 30 is like somebody I'm like, oh, cool, yeah, let's do something together. You know what I'm saying? Like, I make it a point to write everyone back that hits me up, yeah, you know. So, like, if, you know, and I think it works both ways. So, for my advice to you is be like, you know, just start now building that, that network and hitting up that people that you feel are like minded with you on social media. Right. Yeah, and, and I'll add one and we're going to do like three more and be out. But one of the best, uh, when I learned early in my career was like the Nego model. He used to make like 10 of his, like 10 of his items and give five away and sell the other five. I got a question. And so that model of like supporting musicians, supporting like other people is important. Uh, I got a question. I got a question. I got a question. I got a question. I got to raise your hand, hand and I'll pick you. Yeah, I'm raising my hand. Yeah, I'm raising my hand. Yo, for real. Spencer. Yeah. Let me hear from Zambia. Hey, bro. Hey, bro. What's good, Spencer? Hey, bro. How's it going? Good, good. Good. I'm Similar to you, I'm from Ghana. <laughs> and I saw that I'm um, recently. Ah! <laughs> Wait, can everyone mute themselves so we can hear Spencer? So yeah, um, similarly, similar to you, I'm from Ghana. I was born in uh, Toronto, Ontario. And I see that now you're using a lot of references from Africa. 
Um, I'm curious what the process for you was um, like being more vulnerable with your references, um, with more cultural references. And I guess that kind of makes your, I guess, appeal to the audience a bit more specific, being that you started from more American references down to more like specific African and cultural references, if that makes any sense. Yeah. No, that's an excellent point. And thanks for being so like perceptive. Because when I'm here cooking up ideas, I think that like they go over people's head. You know, you don't have that. And it's like, it's my life story. You know, like I want my career to reflect what it's like being born outside of Chicago, like waking up and sort of understanding how the world was coming at me. You know, I was just a black kid in America. Then I used to, you know, eat Ghanaian food in my house. I used to go to school and kids would be like, yo, why does your lunch smell crazy? You know, <laughs> then me, <laughs> you know, then me having to be like, okay, like, like I'm figuring out my identity for myself. Now at the age that I'm at, it's like, and especially 2020, it's like, I have this wealth of like teenage experiences with going to Ghana that no designer in Paris has ever touched. Like, let me start bringing what I am to the table. And it's my, you know, that's exactly how my, your guys' design career should be too. It should just be unraveling who you are, the length that you have to go. Um, let's Richard. go to- Yo, can Rachel. I get on there? Yeah. I got a question. Yeah, I got a question. I got a question. I got a question. Got a question. Oh, we need a, got a question. from a female, so we need like yes. a balance. Divine, let's do Divine. 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 Oh All right, Divine, you're up. And this will be the second to last. Let's go, Divine. Hi. Um, so first, I was one of the um, winners for Postmodern Scholarships. So I want to thank you for this oh, opportunity. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, so my first question is for you two as designers, um, despite COVID and everything that's happening right now, where do you guys see yourselves in the fashion industry in the future, whether it's a year from now, two years from now, et cetera? Angelo, you're up. Hopefully not broke. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, like, like, so, like, here's the thing, you know, like not to go back. Yeah, I guess it is to go back to what Virgil was saying, echoing about being kind of like the first to be in kind of these positions. Like, I, I can't tell you what tomorrow is going to look like. You know what I mean? Like for me, like my, my main my main goal, my main focus is always kind of like the next collection, the next collaboration and kind of putting all the focus and intending that to basically, my goal is to make, you know, just keep making cool products. You know what I mean? And then at the same time, like what I keep saying is like to, to create this platform to, you know, bring, you know, the usher along other people that look like us basically. You know, so like if a store opens up, that's great. If, uh, you know, if I get an investor, that's amazing. You know what I mean? But like, Right now, really, the, the, the main goal is just kind of like, how do, how do I strengthen my brand um, and also strengthen myself as a creative during these times? Yeah, for me, my goal, you know, I'm, I sit at a position that I thought I would never be in. You know, I, I literally was like interviewing for the LV job, like telling myself that there's like no way that they were, that they're literally going to hire, like, you know, like this isn't going to happen, like even though I was going for it. So my goal is, just to make sure young people occupy these very old positions of power and you know showcasing that if i do good at my job and i represent myself well and i stay out of getting in trouble for saying random shit that that they're going to look at cuz that's the whole point of this conversation i don't want to like lose sight of it when you diversify the options you get a better product for the whole and that's like, it's as simple as that. And it doesn't seem that simple. So my goal is to open up doors so that young kids can like get there sooner and prove their worth. And this, that's what this whole, like, that's why we're talking for an hour and a half on Zoom uh, about like trying to give some jewels, like maybe help you guys on your career. 
Last question. Virgil, that's that's me. 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 Abram G. Morris. Oh, okay. Yo, thank you so much. Wants to ask this is yeah. awesome. Um, I'm an architecture student right now, and um, I was wondering if you have any advice for like how to apply those skills that you're learning in your undergrad into like a more broader like creative way so all sorts of other like creative avenues yeah and this one i'll answer in a way like whatever you guys are studying even if you didn't go to college or if you are and you're in a different major than actual fashion the same answer applies it's like root your brand or root your project furthest away from fashion <laughs> like that's just the shorthand analysis because Right now, we're just seeing fashion iterate on fashion and streetwear iter iterate on streetwear. What I'd love to see is a brand that starts with no clothes, like your, your concept should just be a space. You know, like find a vacant lot, find a vacant building, build it out and be like, my brand is this, it's a fashion house. There's no clothes yet. And like, because it's so hard to understand, immediately becomes intriguing to me you know, and immediately will like open the door for you to put product in later. But I would say that like conceptual thinking is gonna be at the forefront. Like don't do what someone else does. Obviously just be abstract with it. Um, okay. Virgil, I have you. a question and it really <laughs> applies to what you just said. Please okay, let me go. ask it. <laughs> Come on, okay. Virgil. Okay, okay, so, okay, so Virgil, basically it's like this, question, right? Virgil. I live, I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I live in Manchester, UK, and I also live in Abuja, Nigeria, right? So I have friends and family like in all these spaces and I'm communicating with them all the time. Jaffo, you got and the fire mic. Your mic is hitting. <laughs> bro, 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 I work, I work from home, man. I work from home. I use this to service engineering companies. Oh, I, I'm a chemical engineer. I service engineering companies over the phone. Like, so that's, that's why I man, that's hear me. Yeah, but okay, okay, okay. Well, no, but here's what I'm talking about though. So I've, so I've got, I've got all these friends in all these spaces all over the world, right? And mm -hmm. I know that I need to Thank capitalize you, on on my on my relationships and these people that I know and like I've been thinking about a brand that's basically a space that exists in those three places right in Minneapolis in Abuja and in uh, and in, in in London but I can't find a way to get the people that I know around the idea and basically align people who are interested in fashion in the way that I am in those spaces to maybe if I make those clothes like you said make 10 have five people in Abuja wear it, have five people in Minneapolis wear it, and have five people in London wear it and post it at the same time on the same day. But I don't, I don't know 15 cool people. I know 15 <laughs> people, but I, know, I don't know 15 cool people who care enough to wear it and own it and really kind of back it the way I want them to back it, if that makes sense. Join the group chat. 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 It's about right, environment. Virgil, oh, Virgil and Angelo. Question, Virgil. Wait a minute before he leaves. Destiny, I wanna Destiny, Destiny, Destiny as the control. outro. Somebody send that chat. One more question. Kobe. Destiny, Destiny, you're muted. Talk a little bit Everybody about one question, a Virgil. <laughs> All right, Destiny with the last one. Oh my gosh. He said, "Give me that album." 
Okay, oh, okay. That's, okay. that's the question. Go for Why it. Why is Nico driving right now? I'm going for it. Okay, I'm going for it. I'm in Chicago, and Virginia told me about you, and I was wondering if I can get an intern position with you at all. Me of too. Any me kind. too. I'm with Destiny. Me too. Me too. <laughs> please, I'm actually really serious, Virgil. Can I please? I'm very serious. Send, send, send the uh, Peter at Fashion Scholarship Fund your information, and we'll talk. To see if I, I have any. Angelo, real you. question though. No, I'm in there too. One does question. That, does that last matter question. for all of us? Yeah, every time I do this, Angelo, now you mentioned like last an official question. Last question, question. question. Angelo. <laughs> all right, so Lee from Zambia. Right, I, I think that's perfect. We got the gist. You know, we, we kind of like did the formal thing, we did the round table thing. Alyssa, Peter, are you going to do an outro? Yeah, and, we're, and you know, guys, we're going to do this again. So there are going to be many more opportunities to ask these questions of Virgil and, and his friends and colleagues. And so thank you. Thank you, Virgil. Thanks, Angelo. And thank you, Nikki, so much for moderating this. And thanks, guys, all of you. Yeah, be, great you. job, Nikki. Thank you, Nikki. <laughs> thanks, thank you. Thank this you, is so Nikki. fun. Thank you, Virgil. Thanks again, Virgil. Thank, thank, thank you, Angelo yeah, and Virgil. Thank, thank you, Virgil. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, much you guys joined the chat. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Th